15 years ago, I moved to North Dakota, only knowing one incredibly busy PhD candidate who did not have a lot of time for me. I am indebted to the late Alan Allery from Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa for hiring me at the National Resource Center on Native American Aging at UND, our sister university. At this job, I worked with one of the panelists, Francine McDonald. For five years, I received regular gifts of enlightenment and opportunities to meet and speak with people from various Native nations. It is always and will always be a personal mission of mine to pay it forward by advocating and enlightening others about diversity topics. Therefore, let's move to learning about our guests. So Francine McDonald has a bachelor's of master's in public administration from the University of North Dakota. She has held various positions within and outside of her tribe and reservation. She is currently an instructor and department chair from the business department at United Tribes Technical College. Francine is a Dakota and an enrolled member of the Spirit Lake Tribe. Her family comes from Spirit Lake and Sisseton. Ola Klimchak is a lifelong learner, and this is Ola. She's a lifelong learner and conservationist, believing in the equity of species. Every day deepening in awareness to the importance of large scale interrelated systems. They have been out in queer gender identity and sexual preference for almost a decade. Ola has been with NDSU as acting youth mentor, educator, photographer, and maker with the Standing Rock Sioux County Extension since September 2017. Sheridan, in front of me is Dakota from Standing Rock and Sisseton Wapiton Oyate. She has worked in the education field for most of her adult life and currently serves as the Career and Technical Education Director for UTTC. She is advisor to a student cultural group on UTTC, UTTC campus. She is passionate about bringing awareness to murdered and missing indigenous women and girls in education. going to a new technological advancement using my cell phone. Petra Harmon one Hawk at the end has her MPH and is currently the Title IX Director for Standing Rock Sioux Tribe Nutrition for the Elder Caregiving Support Program. She is an enrolled member of Standing Rock. Petra has a background in medicine, health, and education. Petra has her BS in biology from the University of North Dakota our sister university. She completed three years of medical school at the University of South Dakota and has her MPH from North Dakota State University. Woo. Our mothership from yesterday. <laughs> she is also an eminent scholar in the Lakota language and culture through Sitting Bull College. She is certified as Lakota language culture teacher through the state of North Dakota and served in the capacity of teacher at various grades and has worked as a medical and health consultant for her tribe for a number of years. In addition, as her role as director, she also serves as a cultural competency instructor for her tribe. She has been a longtime advocate in these areas. Her passion in prevention by using food as medicine, do you wanna say? I don't know if you could hear that. Do you wanna use the mic? I would have practiced, but I just got the word today. So, <laughs> hmm, the words. She is also dedicated to education, cultural competency for all, traditional food conservation, and working to improve food security on the reservation. Okay. As we go forward with this panel, I'd like each of us to realize we're probably going to be uncomfortable. And I don't know about all of you, but for myself, I learn a lot of things when I'm uncomfortable. So let's all look at everything with a good heart and be willing to carry on very valuable 
conversations, ask meaning, meaningful questions, and let's all seek to learn and move forward to be better people. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. At this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to Ola. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Ola, and I use they, them pronouns. I am genderqueer, so um, there's a difference between gender, sex at birth, or assigned sex, and sexuality. So uh, my sex at birth is female, so I do have ovaries, and I do have estrogen in my body. And my sexuality is uh, queer as well, which means that or some people also use the term pansexual, which means that I can be attracted to any kind of person, but the attraction is really only important when it's consensual and it's actually talked about, so I don't usually sexualize people that I'm not in a relationship with. Um, I'm talking a little bit today about the differences and also how it might come across in a workplace when someone's gender isn't affirmed um, as far as both like productivity and then also on the other end of for a coworker who maybe isn't used to using a different um, gender, uh, different pronoun for someone and maybe some tips about how to um, kind of switch over in that transition period. But there are some resources you should be aware of and maybe um, you have seen them. If you're not new to the program, you might have seen them um, in the spring or also in November. Um, but on the NDSU website at ag, so ag.ndsu.edu backslash cff backslash lgbta-1, um, there's a series of six videos, and they do a really good job of going through uh, definitions and also just what we know as far as how people experience going through life um, not heteronormative. So I would recommend looking through that and for more of the details, but I was going to go through more and talk about my background and maybe things you don't think about um, when you're working with a new coworker, someone that recently is coming out as wanting to be who they feel like inside. So um, I've known about my gender identity for uh, as being not heteronormative, meaning not male or female, probably since the age of 14. But like a lot of children, I didn't even know there was anything other than straight, and then I didn't know there was anything other than gay or lesbian until my 20s. Um, specifically with that, too, is even once you find a community, sometimes like when you realize you're not necessarily gay or lesbian or not necessarily male or female identified, there can even be like exclusion from within the like the gay and lesbian community. So that's something to think about when you're working with youth or people that it can be quite a journey to find even the terminology to figure out who you are, let alone how to go through the world. Um, a lot of youth are actually kicked out of their homes. Um, I was lucky enough not to be kicked out of my home um, when I came out, but I actually wasn't able to come out until I was engaged with my partner. <laughs> um, that reason is I went through pretty much daily verbal exposure to homophobia, and but I was lucky enough to not be totally um, expelled from my family, like a lot of people are. So think about when someone comes out, it might be a really big step for them to talk to you about it. Like they might have had to like think about it for quite a while, and um, in some ways I'm. Like, I don't know if fortune is the right word, but I'm able to pass, you know, as female in this world, and that can be hard. Whereas some people recently are coming out as trans, and they're trying to tr transverse this line of figuring out at what point are they going to be actually identified as what they feel like inside. Especially for trans people, it can be like a year of constant therapy, and if you don't have health insurance, it can be very expensive, time-consuming, almost like a part-time job of trying to transition into what you feel like inside. I've known a lot of people when they're on testosterone or estrogen again for the first time, um, it's like going through puberty again. So imagine being a teenager with desires and emotions and like intense mood swings in your 20s and 30s, and then also trying to live your daily life. So not only are you having to do like injections every day, go for therapy, and also then try to cross that line or trying to feel safe, um, both in your home and your community. And it'd be nice to kind of spread a little safety to your workplace. <laughs> you know, so just think about that. And as far as um, like quantifying it, a lot of people have, it's kind of like a known thing that based on people who are willing to talk about their sexuality and their gender, it's at least about 10% of this population, about 10 to 12 that identify as not male or female or identify as um, not straight 
um, sexuality as far as not being identified to the opposite gender. If you're identifying as a female, people might be, identif um, be attracted to a female or to queer people. So at least like one out of 10 people around you that you know identify this way. So it's something that's to think about that it isn't an insignificant number and those are just the folks that feel comfortable talking about it. So imagine that, like how hard it can be to talk about it and to actually be willing to be part of like a statistic. If a good way to be an ally, so if you're thinking about the kind of alphabet soup of LGBTQ, um, there's also the A, so it can stand for asexual, but it also can stand for ally. So if you want to be part of that community and help someone that maybe is having a hard day, like think about ways to make someone feel safe and welcomed. And a way I like to start is regardless of how you identify, like offer your name and your pronoun. So it's also a good way if you forget someone's name, like just make it part of an introduction. You don't have to be ashamed about it. Like just say like for me, like my name is Ola, I use they, them. Um, some people use the word preferred for, for folks, you know, who are going through intense medical or um, intense sessions of therapy. It's not preference. This is how they feel inside. So um, I usually will just say this is what I use instead of using the word preferred, but to even bring up that in a conversation would make someone probably immediately feel safe um, or at least open to um, being understood. So just something to think about when, when you're going through your work lives and when someone comes to you with a, you know, their openness. Um, something also I want to say too is there's the I um, in that alphabet soup, which also means um, intersex. So not only is uh, gender as far as male and female not necessarily the only things out there because, or sorry, not gender, sex as a sex in birth. Um, some people aren't born with chromosomes that match your genitalia. So you might have a vagina and ovaries, or you might have testes and a penis, but you might actually have chromosomes that are slightly different, or your body might not produce um, hormones in that same way. So for me, even if I wanted to transition, I have a disease called endometriosis, which literally means that my uterine wall spills on my uterus, coats my whole abdominal cavity, and I produce excess estrogen. So even if I want to transition, the act of taking testosterone would increase my estrogen for a period of time it would be unsafe and likely mean I would need surgery again and not be able to work for about a month. So just to think about it, like there is a spectrum. You can't always assume. Um, try to have an open heart. And for me, I just like to um, – I don't want it to be like the main conversation or what hap ha or what has to take over like a relationship at work. I just try to present my pronoun and just go on with being a person. Because it's just part of me, but it's not everything that I am. But for some people, it's something that's on their mind every day if they are um, transitioning. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ola, for that. That was um, really informational. Yahani washte matakia bi oyate o hoi chara wi machia bi chante nape washte chiusa bi. Good morning, my friends and relatives. My name, my Dakota name is Respects the People Woman. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm a crier, <laughs> and <laughs> um, and it's. It's emotional for me even to say my Dakota name because the respects the people woman, that name was given to me by my grandmother um, after she was observing me um, interact with people at one of our ceremonies. And for me, that's, it's a huge honor for, for her to see me that way through her eyes, but it's also a responsibility for me to live up to that name and to always remember um, my place in this world and how I need to be respectful and it's it's a really it's a big struggle um, because the things that our people have to endure and go through and to have to remember that I need to be respectful not only because of what my grandmother has seen in me um, but just to be a good relative to you all be a good mother um, and so that responsibility sometimes is really hard to remember um, when your anger or your passion and things, you know, just take over you. So um, I want to thank you all for, for being here and having an open heart and an open mind. Um, when we learned of the topic 
um, you know, being comfortable in an uncomfortable um, situation or, you know, however it was worded, sorry. Um, you know, I, I was excited, but yet I knew, you know, that this might be a hard morning. Um, and I really encourage you all to ask those questions that you've always been wanting to ask. Um, I'll share with you how I've been taught and the things that I know. Um, by no means, you know, am I speaking on anyone's behalf or anything. Um, by no means am I an expert in our culture, our beliefs or anything. I'm still learning a lot. Um, but I try to carry myself in the best way that I can. Um, but some of the things that I think, you know, taking this step and being here and wanting to learn, you know, about our, our different backgrounds and our people and everything, you know, our, our, I really appreciate you guys all being here. Um, there's so many things and I don't think, you know, we're going to have time to talk about a lot of things today and, and hopefully we have time to open it up to a lot of questions. Um, I was telling my husband, you know, over the past, past few days here about, you know, the topics and things I'm kind of anticipating, you know, might come up. And then I started putting a list on my phone of things that I would like to talk about that I felt were important um, to bring awareness to and things like that. Uh, so if I'm looking down at my phone, you know, I apologize, but that's kind of my reminders and things like that. But I'd really just want to open it up, you know, to to questions and and hear your guys' perspective on on some things. But, you know, like I said, the questions, um, you know, I can give you, you know, my word that I won't be offended or anything like that by any of the questions that you have. Um, in my bio, you know, I said I was passionate about education as well as MMIW things. And because I think education, you know, if we learn about one another, you know, that's going to help us squash all these stereotypes and barriers and things like that and hate. Um, and just by understanding one another and taking the time to learn about each other, um, I really appreciated, um, you know, the introductions, not by us, but by Kim and Sue, and they had acknowledged, you know, their ancestors and where they're from, and that's one thing that I always, you know, encourage people is, is that we're all, we all come from somewhere, you know, and, and that might be different places, um, but, you know, and, um, but just to remember those teachings and, and how we're more similar than we are different um, and, and have that respect for one another. I was, I'm really fortunate to be a part of different groups to Bismarck area when um, I've just moved up here about three years ago um, from, from Standing Rock, I'm from Cannonball. Um, and in order for my son to get a better education, um, he's into robotics and engineering and things like that and we can't get those classes back home. And so when he was going to be a freshman in high school, um, I'd made the choice that you know, he had set some high educational goals for himself and he had the interests that couldn't be fulfilled back home. And so I had to take us out of our culture and bring us up here just in order for him to get that better education. And we were fortunate to have the means to be able to do that. Um, so because of that move, I've been really fortunate to be a part of different groups here in Bismarck. And one of the smaller groups that I belong to um, one of our first meetings, they had talked about providing a safe place for people to talk their truths and to be able to have, you know, hard discussions. And, and the group, I'm the only Native one in that group. Um, and so I was sitting there listening, you know, and, and this was, I think, our first or second meeting, and, and that had really kind of stuck out in my mind, you know, I really appreciated that providing a safe place to have uncomfortable discussions. But the one thing that I had brought up was that, you know, how I appreciated having this space, but are you ready to accept the truth, my truth, and the things that I want to share? Acceptance of that truth, acceptance of our stories or your stories or, you know, anybody else's out there, um, you know, is a big part. So just kind of, you know, remember that I feel like, you know, you've created this safe place to have this discussion, but I hope that you have those open hearts. Um, and I hope that, you know, between our shared stories that we share here that, you know, it, it has an impact 
positive impact on you and that you can you know, af affect someone else's life positively um, in some way or another. So thank you again for um, to the coordinators of this event and again to all of you for um, for being here and, and wanting to listen. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Francine McDonald. Um, this is really an appropriate topic for me uh, becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable because I am really not comfortable public speaking, even though I'm an instructor. So, so but I, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I will, I'm open to sharing anything that I know or um, that I, that you feel that can be helpful to you and in, in the job that you do. Um, I thank you, Kim, for inviting us to be here on your panel. And I just want to share a little bit about my background. Um, I come from Spirit Lake Reservation. Um, and my background is probably you is one of those um, um, stereotypical um, households that you probably heard about um, for Indian reservations. I come from a single parent home. I was raised by my mother. Actually didn't meet my father until I was about eight or nine. Not because we didn't know who my father was, but just because he was an absent father. Um, I was raised in a family that drank a lot. Um, but um, even though we had all those hardships, it does, didn't mean that um, I was going to be that way. And I think that's the thing that I feel that I want to inspire the like the kids that I teach at United Tribes is that um, you might face hardships throughout your life but doesn't mean that you have to be that way um, my mom was a drinker um, my dad was a drinker but I wasn't a drinker so I that just because they were doesn't mean that I am so um, and I guess looking at families or um, what you believe about um, natives or Indians is um, um, try to get to know them first or know about them first because we're we um, we are not the stereotypes that um, we are portrayed a, a lot um, um, we are not all alcoholics we're not all drug abusers we have our same problems that every community has but um, we um, there are a lot of good that also comes with that bad so um, and we're not um, closed off we are open to being asked questions. We are open to having dialogue with um, um, people of different races or um, different backgrounds. Um, and um, I guess um, we were taught to be really friendly, to be um, to treat everybody good. That's part of our culture. Um, so and and we're just we're never ever not every day we're told you need to treat everybody good. It's just the way that we're brought up. Um, that that um, it's not expected of us. It's just the way we're brought up again. So um, don't take it at face value when you meet someone or when you work in a community. I guess is what I wanted to you to take away from us is to get to learn the people and get to learn who you're working with. Um, don't be scared to ask questions or to visit with the people. All right. Thank you. Honey, washte. Just like Sheridan said, chante washte nape chiu zapi means um, I extend my hand out to you with a good heart, and that's one of our teachings. With like Francine shared, is that even though we come from different bands, um, we come from a big tribe known as the Ocheti Shakowi, the Seven Council Fires, and um, moving about in this world with a good heart, chante washte. So when I say I'm happy, it's chante mawashte. I'm, I'm, my heart is happy. My heart is, is well. And, and in our prayers, you ask the creator, you ask God, clear my heart, clear my mind so that I can do good in this world. And so, um, you know, the sad thing is that we're, we have as a people become very um, disconnected from those teachings. And, and that was by design. So um, there's... I kept remind, keep reminding myself that this is a really short time, but I really encourage you to read on history, read, um, read our history, 
and what has happened to our people and what is still continuing to happen to people. And it's not just our people because I, you know, um, I, I'm a storyteller. So when I went to medical school, um, that, was, that was the time I went through culture shock because that's the first time that I was totally immersed among, and I don't like to call white people because we don't call, we're not red people or, you know, and then they call, you know, they call it black people. So because as us, we identify with our bands, our tribe, our teoshpaye, we, we identify with our families. So that's really a, a hard concept. Um, so that was in, when I was in medical school, that was the first time I had total immersion and I didn't know I was going through culture shock. And, and that's not the time to go through culture shock. <laughs> so, um, so, so needless to say, there were a lot of questions that I had. And what I realized was that, um, you know, there's always cultural diversity trainings for, um, I say, European Americans. Because um, to learn about us, but it has never happened for me that I never learned about the cultural norms of European Americans. Um, so here I was in medical school trying to say, um, we have this practice that you know, we'd go out to lunch and I'll get you, um, oh, I, you know, my classmate would say, oh, I forgot my wallet in the car. Well, that's okay, I'll get it for you. And, and it's called doksha. It, it, you know, I'll cover it for you and then you you know, that just means later, you know, if I am in the sim same situation, you extend the same grace to me. But she would say, nope, that's okay. I'll, I'll just go without. So then I, my feelings were hurt. I didn't, why, why won't she t accept my friendship? Why doesn't she want to be friends or, you know, so it was really, really tough. And so I, I had to ask those questions and I, and I've, um, it, I've been blessed to have people who would help me to understand, but I also, I still have questions because some of these practices, um, I always think, is it the process that happened? Um, and I, I call it, oftentimes I think of it as the immigrant way. So what happened, what happened in that process of immigration um, because there was a disconnect from Europe. There was a disconnect from the huge families over there. There was this giving up of things. And in the process, does that harden people? Because, and I ask that because we've had to experience a lot of things growing up. Um, and my mother is what they call a full blood. She's Lakota and Shoshone, so she's all Indian. And I've watched her be mistreated more so because we're, um, um, the, uh, her children were lighter skinned. And so um, she never taught us, she always says there's good people and there's bad people in every group of people. And she never, she never taught us to, to be hateful. And just like Francine said, we were talked to, to that you pray for them. As mean as they were, you pray for them because in their heart, something isn't right in their heart, that they have to be that mean to people. And so um, uh, Sheridan shared her Indian name, and um, mine is Wa'ushalami, which is compassionate woman. And uh, that's a tough name to have to live by. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm the director for nutrition for the elderly, and following the DASH diet and the menu uh, and the recommendations from USDA and my native plate, it's tough as a Lakota to, to give out these portion control meals and, and the elders are telling me that's not enough. <laughs> so it's, it's tough, but um, I, could, I could go on and on, but some of the words I wanted to, to throw out there just for people to think about is that, um, in public health, we, we are really trained in cultural competency and the danger in being culturally incompetent. And, and that's when people don't even know that they're culturally incompetent is that they're, they're then culturally destructive. 
And so the best thing to know, I mean, the best thing to move forward into this uncomfortable situation is just to, to step back and say, okay, I don't know, but I'm open to learning and having that cultural humility that we are all different and of course, as humans, we all have our basic needs. We all have our similarities, but culture-wise, there's there's these differences, and and that's okay. That's what that's the beauty of of the world, and that's the beauty of the human race. And so, um, the other thing is the talking about the the uncomfortableness. There's even a term for that now, and that that term is white fragility. So looking up that term and reading about it, and it's not that um, you should feel guilty about anything. Dr. Phil, actually, I just watched a video on this with Dr. Phil, and he was saying, you know, it's not that you did anything wrong. It's just that the system is designed to to um, um, to add or the the system is designed for the advantages for white people. And, and so oftentimes, I like that when people acknowledge who their ancestors are, because that's a big cultural component for us as we acknowledge who our ancestors is. And so when people ask me who are European American, ask me about, well, I, what if I don't want to say I'm white anymore? Well, you, you have it. I mean, you have, you're a German, Norwegian, you're, you have that ancestry. You have ancestry. And, and well, I'm all these other things too. So I'm, I'm all mixed up. And these, these are some of the comments I got. And my, my recommendation is that in our culture, and of course in each Teoshpae, the extended family and the bands, it's different. But in my Teoshpae, we really believe and follow that you are what your mother is. So you follow, we're matrilineal and we follow that. So even though, like, for example, my, my father is what we call Spaula, he's Mexican. I was raised with my mother's people and I spent time with my father's family in the summer times. Um, I'm really raised and my, my worldview, my thought process is really Lakota. But there's still things that are still, um, I, I say as my collective memory that are Mexican. For example, living in North Dakota where there's not kala lilies all over the place, but I really love them for some reason. And then when I went to Mexico, they grow all over the place. So I, I would think, you know, for me, that was my experience. And just um, knowing some European Americans who have gone back to their countries because you also have that, and that's beautiful, that you can go back to what was your ancestors' original homelands and reconnect. So I think we'll stop there. Thank you all for being here and sharing your stories. At this point, although we do have some scenarios and questions, we want to give you a chance to, to think and process. And, and Sue will be walking around the room. If you want to raise your hand, she'll let you ask your question. And as the panelists said, please feel comfortable knowing that they are open to any question. I would just okay. Give him a second. <laughs> Again, I'd like you guys to please just give everyone on the panel a hand. I've got the best job in NDSU because I get to work with these people. Who has a question they'd like to ask? Thanks. Uh, this is a question for Ola. You mentioned sex versus gender as different concepts, and I've, I've heard that before, and I've never really understood it. I was wondering if you could clarify, clarify that difference. Thanks. Uh, absolutely. So um, sex can be identified as, we'll say, what a doctor um, puts on your birth certificate. So that would be um, indicated by your genitalia, hormones, um, sex organs. And then gender is a, a kind of a blend of how society sees you. Um, so there's like the societal gender and then personal expression of gender. So gender for, say, a personal expression is how someone sees themselves or how someone presents themselves in society. So say, um, like, I can be, like, 
female on my birth certificate, but I can present myself one day as male if I wanted to. I could present myself as gender neutral. So um, say society, like American society, so it depends on where you are. Um, gender, say here, versus in a different country might be different. So a gender can be a mix of physical attributes, meaning like hair, um, makeup, clothing, um, physical mannerisms, or it can be cultural. So it can also be like what, what um, when does someone enter a room? When does someone participate in a meal? Um, what are some of the greeting rituals of a particular culture? And that's can be really deeply ingrained in gender. So um, sex tends to relate to um, your physical sex. And then gender is either how you present yourself in the world or how the world is gendering you based on someone's um, processing of physical cues. Next question. Hi, I'm Jan Stankowitz. I use she and her and my ancestors come from Norway and Germany. This question is also for Ola. Um, so in extension, we need to get data and we need to have surveys and post surveys. Um, how might we go about getting survey data and reporting accurately to federal registers um, in gender neutral or gender queer audiences? Yeah, um, so in medical school, we had to study embryology. And it was really interesting because um, Ola had mentioned that there's this broad spectrum. And in and, and studying embryology, which was a whole semester, we learned about how the body becomes um, what it is at, at the time. And it's not as simple as we think in regards to fe female and male. And um, and it was really sad because we also had to read the book and I don't remember the title but it was about these twin boys um, and one of them had a botched circumcision and um, the group of doctors who treated him actually they botched his circumcision and so then they just declared him a female and dressed him as a female and a little girl but he always knew that something wasn't quite right and actually it was those group of doctors who decided in the me medical field who who have decided to, even to this day that a doctor has to declare the sex of the of the child at birth so it doesn't even it doesn't even give time for the body to figure out um, what what it's going to be what path it's going to be and it's it, it's there's all these um, um, different, um, um, and, and Ola does a really good, um, has a way of uh, explaining it, but, um, you know, the, the body just, there, there's the hormones, um, in the brain, there's the hormones from the, the, um, ovaries or the testes, the liver processes the hormones. If there's something that doesn't function right, um, for example, uh, if, if even in, in men, if they're to drink too much and their liver starts to fail, they're no longer going to be able to filter the estrogen. And so they're going to start to have be estrogenized and, and start to take on female characteristics. And so the body is really complex in those regards. And, and then the testosterone, there's testosterone receptors or estrogen receptors that fail to work. And so, um, in medical school, and that's that's why it was hard to ha go through that culture shock because culturally, in Lakota, um, we didn't declare the the sex of a child until they were eight years old, and so we were we were treated as wakanya um, ja. You're just children, in general, up until that age, and then when they were eight years old, they would go with their aunts or they would go with their uncles to learn their role. Um, what their role was in life, and um, and 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 so, and we so we also acknowledge that there were um, different different um, genders. There's there were different genders. So we have um, males who uh, 
we call them wink does, but they're, they're males, but their outward expression is females. So that was present in our culture. And so it's really difficult when we're going, we're going through the education and um, we see that when, when I saw that, that was really hard for me because to me, it was really sad that, um, that children are declared that at their, at their birth, even if their body hasn't decided what it's going to be yet. Thank you, Petra. So in relation to the question, that was a conversation we've actually had multiple times today. Um, when it comes to transgender, I would, as far as people who are um, stating that they are now going by female or are going by male, I would recommend on the reports that go by the stated gender. Um, as far as gender queer people, I really don't know currently. So that might be something to ask, like, is that necessary for reporting? Are there other ways to, um, still get what you need as far as the information, but is the gender necessary for that as far as trying to quantify um, who you're serving? And that's a really good question. It might be something to kind of think about moving forward um, with how you structure reporting. Um, but as far as currently, I would recommend if someone identifies, um, be it a coworker or a participant in a program, um, as female, I would state them as that, or as male, I would state them as that. Um, you might want to ask if the gender career person is comfortable talking about it, if they are comfortable with, you know, um, going on the form one way or the other, or at least saying that you see them and understand that they're, according to this form, there isn't a place to put their information on it. Maybe you can, I don't know if it's possible to not check a box, but at least say that you see them as a person, but you're in this position where you have to write this report and not saying that it at all like minimizes who they are and that you're aware of the situation. Leave, even giving awareness is a big step. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Anita Chirmamilla and I'm com I am an extension agent uh, in Cavalier County. Uh, my origin is India. And so I think we have a lot of <laughs> commonalities. Most of the people, I do look like you too, you know. So. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I was a student in NDSU, I was uh, going to downtown in Fargo, you know, there used to be some Indians who used to come walk right to me and then they used to start talking the language. And I said like, I am an Indian. And so like, yeah, yeah. I, like, <laughs> I come from India. <laughs> but, being an immigrant and uh, just like you, you know, um, human beings, uh, you know, they, they, whether they accept it or not, every human being has a racial bias. You, you being, you, you have your own racial biases and I have mine. And being an immigrant, I, I face that all the time, um, but not to the, maybe not to the extent that you do, but still I do. Um, I, what I, uh, I want to know is like uh, the fem gender bias, female bias. Do you have that in your culture? Because I do have, have in my culture and uh, I see that in US too. And the fact that US says that it is a great country, it may be in every other means, but the fact that it doesn't have a US president until now, I don't see that. You know, every other country, the third world countries, everybody have a, a female, uh, you know, president or prime minister, but not U.S. until now. I'm not saying that Hillary Clinton should be. <laughs> please, please don't take that. But I'm saying that the female bias is still there. And it adds, adds a layer of, uh, uh, another layer of bias just for sure, uh, women. Do you experience that? Is that in your culture? That's my first question. And the second one is, do you experience that in your work life? Um, yes, we do, we do experience it in our culture. And I just want to share with you that we're in a time of rebirth and renewal and revitalization. It's um, the 40th anniversary this year for the Indian Religious Freedom Act. So it wasn't until 1978 that we had the freedom to practice religion in this country. And um, so my mother is the last generation um, that was forced into boarding school 
and forced to be Christian, forced to be Catholic. So we're also Catholic in our family. Um, and so there's, uh, there's, there is definitely similarities in our, in our, in the in Catholicism and in our belief system, in regards to the teachings of Jesus. But um, in all of that too, it has created almost a mass confusion among our people. So assimilation has really been forced upon us in the last 150 years. So General George Patton, he said, uh, oh, Pratt, it was Pratt. He said, uh, um, kill the Indian and save the man. So that's, that was the start of the boarding school era. And my great, my great grandfather was the first among the wave of children to have to go to Carlisle boarding school. And um, uh, it's really sad and heartbreaking because a lot of those children never came home. So I always think of a story um, when, Math when, when Nelson Mandela was in prison and he was freed and he came home, they asked him, what did you miss the most when you were in prison? And he said, the laughter of children. And I can't imagine what our ancestors, what our relatives felt when the villages were completely empty of all the children because they were taken away and forced into boarding school. And so now um, what I see in our communities is really people struggling to find their place back into a society. So the cultural competency doesn't just have to happen for the non-Indians, it has to happen for our own Indian people. And so, um, I, it is really, it is really a beautiful time for us to live in as Indian people. Um, grant, uh, and I say that amongst, um, in what we see. For example, um, Sheridan has this, this skirt on, this skirt that is um, printed, um, is actually printed, and we can, we can buy that off the internet. Uh, there's, you know, we can go on the internet and buy things that are, are culturally um, appropriate clothing for us. Whereas when we were growing up, that was not available to us. The language was not available to us. I asked if we could learn it in, in high school and they told me that, um, uh, no, there's no reason for you to learn it because you're not going to have a use for it. And when I taught summer school for the summer program in Grand Forks, they told me not to teach anything culturally related because there was no use for it in science. And so, um, so I think, I think that it, it's it, it is because of the assimilation process that we really have to deal with the misogyny that is existent. But historically, we've had a great place in our societies as matrilineal um, societies and um, we we have to draw from our collective memory for that because historically in the books when you go to college and you read those books um, the writings and the books from the late 1800s was from the eyes of a European male for example Lewis and Clark and so they really um, painted a picture that was self-serving for them and not so much the true picture of what was going on in our society. And so, for example, I, I'll share this story in regards to the chiefs having multiple wives. So that's the, the common stereotype or misnomer. And even our people carry that on. Oh, he had multiple wives or he had five wives. But culturally, when you when you learn our when you're learning our language and our tiospaye, the way that we're related, it's all diff it's um it's very much different than the way the Europeans are related to each other. So for example, my sisters, I have five sisters. When we have children, they don't call any of my sisters aunts. They're all Ina. They're all their moms were all their mothers. And so what did it look like if, if I was in the 1800s and, and all my sisters came over and my husband came in, um, came in and here's all these children calling all these women, Ina, calling them all mothers. It looks like my husband has multiple wives and these are all his children. And so that's how it got documented. And the thing is, is if, if say if my sister 
heaven forbid. Well, historically, if a sister lost a husband, she would be taken in by her sister who was married so that that male also provided for her. So we had these, we had these tight obligations to each other. So um, historically, we really have to, we have to pick things apart and redefine things for ourselves as, as Indian people. And that's not so easy. Next question. Before I ask um, uh, you the question, I, I want to apologize because I do not mean to stereotype you. So my question is that uh, my my um, exposure to Indian people or Native American people or in Canada, they call them Native Canadian, is just the Western movies. So, and I still like Gunsmoke. Um, I try to watch it every night if our kids let us do that. So my question is that, uh, and again, I'm not trying to stereotype you, but uh, you mentioned a very good point, like there are lots of misconceptions. So one of the misconceptions or a slight reality, I hear that uh, the youth is into drugs, unemployment. What do you see is a positive path? And Francine, it's for you. You grew up in that environment, but you didn't follow that path. So two things. Number one, how can you bring your youth to become positive individuals who will contribute to your tribes and the community? And how could you remove those misconceptions? Um, the misconception is that, um, I think, is that um, Indian country or Indian reservations are the only place that have drug problems and that's not true as in your communities if you look at your communities you'll realize that there's drug problems there too so how do we any of us address this um, issue I know they're trying to address it on a national level but on a personal level or at, um, and I say personal because my home is personal um, my home reservation is personal how do we address that at home is um, we try to have more positive influence for our youth to educate them about the dangers of drug use, um, to um, um, have um, activities for our youth to do. We are bringing them back to the horse, which is a um, healing for our youth. Um, bring, um, of doing different things, are trying different things with our youth. There, I don't think there's one best practice, but um, as long as we keep trying to address that drug issue with our youth, then I think we um, that is a good thing. I don't know what may be different than my mom or my dad in um, um, when growing up. I just knew that I didn't want to be like that. Um, I didn't want to um, 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 drink all the time or um, um, and my mom, even though she was a drinker, she did encourage us to um, get our education to go on to college. I'm the first one in my family to get a college degree. Um, and I don't know what that what made me do that, but I do know that I had the support to do that in in the form of my mom and um, my other siblings and my um, um, my spouse. Um, it to um, so I had that support there. So having uh, if the children have that support, then um, I think that is um, something that could help them deal with drug issues. Are and the school systems play a big part of uh, in this problem too. To um, making sure that our we're building those self confidence in schools. One of the biggest problems I found, I used to be an um, advisor for the Upward Bound Program out of the University of North Dakota, your sister school. <laughs> 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 but, um, and, when, and my job was to go out to visit the different schools that we are, that had under our program and they were used, um, they were reservation schools. Um, I went to Turtle Mountain, I went to Fort Berthold and I went back to my home reservation to Spirit Lake. Um, to visit with the students that we had in the program. 
and our job is to encourage these students to um, go on to college, to get that college degree, um, to go further than just high school. Um, but when I would go into the high school, um, and I'm just going to speak about my own high school at um, um, Fort Totten. Going into that high school and visiting with a young lady there, a student there, and talking to her about um, taking college algebra in school. Um, because it's going to help her with our taking algebra in school because it's going to help her to, um, with college algebra, which she'll have to take when she gets to college. Um, but what she told me is that her um, advisors in the school system um, didn't push the students that way. They pushed them more to general math or um, um, a easier math just to get them through and then get them graduated. That's not doing anything for our students when um, we're not challenging them. Um, our students can be challenged, and they will live up to that challenge. Um, but um, when our school systems don't challenge those students, then um, I think we're failing our students. We're setting them up for failure. Um, if we could um, have more belief in the school systems that our students are, um, stronger people that they can do more, then I think um, that will help out with um, the type of environment that they come from, that they, that'll make them stronger. Um, so I, I don't know what made me different than um, everybody else from our family to go, uh, to go on to school, but um, I think it's just having a really strong um, support system. And I think you could do that in any community. It's just not native communities are um, so being there for our students and being there for our children. Thank you for the question. If I could just add to that. Um, I sat in on a presentation with Dr. Uh, Donald Warren, who many of you probably know, um, and he had a really good point. He was talking about, about that alcoholism on reservations and drug abuse and things like that. And then he said, but what if there was a study done to, to measure or to get the data on all of the native people on different reservations who completely abstain from alcohol and drugs? That data has never been reported. Um, there are many of us who abstain from alcohol and drugs and tobacco and things like that for ceremonial purposes, um, just for the lives that we lead. Um, you know, for different reasons, and yet, you know, that's never been talked about. And so, you know, would it be higher than the drug abuse and alcohol? You know, I, I don't know, but that's just something that's not been talked about and not ever been collected, I guess, you know, for, for the people that would need to see that data and things. So, but like Francine said, you know, it's not just an, just an issue, you know, on native lands by any means, you know, I'm sure we're all aware of that, um, but it just seems that, um, that, when we start talking about all these different disparities in North Dakota and things like that, then the, the tribal nations are, are the, the easiest ones to pick on because those are, that's what's always being reported on is the, the statistics on tribal lands and things like that. So, um, but yeah, thank you for the question. There is a difference between racism and discrimination. So does anyone know the definition of racism? Yes, the, the, the key word in that is the power difference. And so yes, we all have, as humans, we all have the, we all have it in us to discriminate. I like Starbucks more than caribou coffee, you know, <laughs> so, but, but racist, racism, when if someone was to accuse me of being racist, um, they can't do that necessarily because my people don't have, are not in a position of power to be racist. So for example, if I'm to go into a bank and Sue is to go into a bank and we both ap apply for car loans, Sue comes out with a 5% interest rate and I come out with a 15% interest rate based on skin color, that's racism. So. And this is the truth. I took a young lady that's in our program to help her purchase a vehicle. 
they quoted me one interest rate when they thought I was buying it. When they found out she was buying it, he said, oh, we need to check her zip code and her interest rate would be 14 and a half percent. This is real. It happens every day. Just real quickly, I know we're out of time too. There's there's so much and I feel like we didn't really get to talk about a lot of uncomfortable issues, but the questions, you know, were a lot of educational stuff, which was great. But, um, you know, that, that real in this day, you know, um, we were sent, well, I don't know if everyone was sent, but then we were forwarded by President McDonald. Um, some of the, because I wasn't quite sure, you know, besides the title of it, like what's what to expect and things. And so we were forwarded some kind of sample questions, I think that you guys might have sent in. Um, but one of them had something to something to the effect of um, if you heard a really racist comment or things like what what can you do to overcome that? and um, then it talked about the history, given the history of the recent history of the events in North Dakota, how would that, and, and I kind of laughed because it's like, well, are you talking like which history? And of course it was probably the DAFL, but it's like, are we talking pre-Garrison Dam or, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, you know, history that had happened that wasn't good for our people. But um, in today's world, what Sue said is, is alive and real, um, even walking in the hallway, um, you know, a lot of people just kind of, you know, that kind of weird, you know, awkward, like kind of smile, turn, look away, like they didn't know what to do. Um, and so when I put on our, our traditional, and this isn't a traditional skirt, you know, this is a beautiful skirt that I can't take any credit for other than paying for it. Um, you know, but when I put in our, our ribbon skirts, you know, and which now is considered kind of a traditional thing, but, um, it's, I know I'm a target as soon as I walk out the door. I know I'm a target. When I stand in line at the cashier, I'm waiting just to be treated normal. I'm waiting for that cashier to ask me, you know, did I find everything? Did you, you know, did you find everything that you needed? And not just to look down and start swiping my things because those happen. And I don't want to have to feel that anger or that anticipation. I was at the doctor's office probably last year, I think, and one of the things in our culture is to be respectful is we're looking down when someone is talking. And in this day and age, and to be a leader in your school or your communities or whatever, in our culture, it's hard for me to sit here and to look out at you in the eyes because that's not something that we're taught growing up that is respectful, that's being disrespectful if I sit there and stare at you in the eyes. But in today's world, to be assertive, to be this, I need to be looking at you. But I was at the doctor's office and he was telling me all the do's and don'ts and things like that. And I was sitting there and I was just looking down at the floor thinking like I'm listening, I'm being respectful. And he looks over at me and he goes, Ooh, are you listening to me? Ooh. And um, I'm sorry, I didn't uh -huh. need that. <laughs> He didn't slap me on the leg. He was slapping the desk in front of me. But um, I was hurt because I thought I was being so respectful. And, and to him, I wasn't. But yet he thought he could, and he did. He, he did that to me, just slammed on the desk. So it's very much alive. Um, it takes everything that I have to come out and dress how I want to dress, how I'm proud to dress, but I know I'm a target as soon as I walk out my door. And that hurts. And that's something that I don't want for my children. You know, I want them to feel safe. I want them to be proud of who they are. It's, and I would be, I, I just, I need to mention Halloween. Um, is, is uncomfortable, the, ma the costumes and things like that. And I need to mention this because of the murdered and missing women, indigenous women thing. When, when you encourage or when your child wants to go and put on, or your daughters, your grown daughters or whatever wants to go and put on a sexy Indian woman costume and go wear it to a party, or the male wants to put on something like that, you're dehumanizing our people. You're putting me and my daughters and all of our women and girls at risk for being sexualized and dehumanized. 
And so if you take anything away from here for this month and for every Halloween thereafter, is go to your schools and ask them to just please be more respectful of the costumes that they allow in their school systems not just of native costumes, but of whatever other costumes that might dehumanize a, 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 a people. And that would help, that would really help. And that's why, you know, you see all these different Megyn Kelly's blackface, you know, news story has been out this week. And her comment was because it was okay when she was growing up, as long as you were dressed as a character, that character is a race of people. And that's the dehuman, human, dehumanizing portion of it. That's why it's not right. It's not a character. That's a person. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry to have to end. I think we have so many more things we could say um, and, and comment and a lot of more questions. But I'm going to end with a quote. We need to give each other the space to grow, to be ourselves, to exercise our diversity. We need to give each other space so that we may both give and receive such beautiful things as ideas, openness, dignity, joy, healing, and inclusion. Let's help give a round of applause for our speakers today. I'm not sure of the next session, but we are done with this. Is it a break? Can somebody tell me the next sketch thing? Or is it World Cafe? So welcome back, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs>